we align our own goals and our purpose to such objectives and organizations? And why should we? Do we even have a choice? More so in this new COVID-19 world that we have no choice but to live in. My guest for today will take a stab at many of these pressing matters as we and our organizations manage radical transformation and change. And none of these, by the way, are cliches anymore, given what we are going through. So I'm pleased to introduce and present Salim Ismail, a technology strategist, software engineer, and successful entrepreneur, futurist, best-selling author of Exponential Organizations and Exponential Transformation. He's been bu building disruptive digital companies as a serial entrepreneur since the early 2000s. He is also founding executive director of Singularity University and co-founder and chairman of OpenXO, a global transformation ecosystem that connects world-class professionals with organizations, institutions, and people who want to build a better future through cutting-edge ideas and actionable methodologies. The XO consulting ecosystem consists of more than 155 certified coaches and advisors from 29 countries in 24 different languages. So that's something that you want to look at more closely if indeed you embark on the path that you shall hear more about. So Salim also founded and led some of the most influential tech companies at the foundation of our digital society, including PubSub Concepts and Angstro, which aggregated a lot of news and business news in, as I could see, uh, a world that I come from. And uh, both these companies, the, com the latter was acquired by Google in 2010. He's also led Yahoo's internal incubator Brickhouse and is an XPRIZE Foundation board member. Salim also founded the Fast Track Institute, which harnesses new technologies to solve the most pressing problems faced by cities today. Uh, much uh, needed uh, uh, in, uh, input into uh, our lives where we are. I'm in Mumbai and uh, Salim is in uh, Toronto, by the way. Uh, he also sits on the board of Roker uh, 3 Inc. and is a general partner at its uh, Roker 3 uh, Fuel XO Venture Fund, where he identifies the next founders of exponential growth companies. And uh, that's indeed the right point, I think, to uh, hand over to Salim and welcome him to our uh, TEDx conversation today. Salim, it's over to you. And thank you very much once again uh, to you uh, for joining us. And my uh, uh, extended thanks to the TEDx team for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much, Govind Raj. Uh, great to be with you all. Uh, obviously, I'm a huge fan of a lot of what you've been doing, tracking a lot of the speakers that you have, which are awesome. Um, let me share my screen and I'll run through a short talk and then we can open up to the Q&A. Uh, the, the, my journey really starts, you heard a lot of my background, so I won't cover that, but I'm actually from Mumbai, uh, originally grew up in Bandra, uh, moved, emigrated to Canada when I was 10 years old and did my school in university here. Uh, then I was in Europe for 10 years, uh, restructuring a lot of I, I researched a lot of French companies, which is, I think, why I'm bald. If you've interacted with a French company, that will make some sense. Um, and um, well, my journey really starts at Yahoo, uh, where I was the head of innovation uh, and ran their incubator called Brickhouse. And I learned a fundamental lesson, which is driving a lot of my thinking today, and actually we're seeing in live action in the world, which is when you try disruptive innovation in a legacy environment, the immune system attacks you, right? You try anything really crazy and all the antibodies come out. And this is bad in a big company and most big companies face this problem. Uh, what I was struck by was that Yahoo was less than 10 years old. You know, you could expect it at a bank or a telco, but why at this uh, very young company? And, and how does this happen? Um, obviously it's much worse in the public sector where existing policy is the immune system and you have bankers fighting Bitcoin and uh, taxis fighting Uber. Uh, academia is probably the worst immune system we have. God help you if you try and update uh, that. Um, but from Yahoo, I went on to help build out uh, Singularity University uh, as the founding CEO, and then as a, led most of the programs for about a seven, eight year period. So if I have a secret superpower, uh, it's probably that if there's a discussion, lecture, lab, workshop on say blockchain, I've heard it 60 times, autonomous cars 60 times, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is an important starting point for this discussion because the key insight that Ray Kurzweil had, along with Peter Diamandis, that led them to create Singularity University was that the idea of Moore's law, doubling patterns in computation that we've seen now for 60 years uninterrupted um, has been going on since actually uh, the early 1900s. And Ray put this graph together uh, showing that price performance of computation has been going on for that long. And the question that he asked when he saw this graph 
was why is that curve so smooth and so predictable? You know, we've had wars and recessions and ups and downs in the industry. You should expect a very jagged stock market shape, and not this incredibly steady progression that we see here. And he spent a full 10 years researching this, trying to understand why this was happening, and came up with a pretty fundamental observation, uh, which is once you take any uh, domain, discipline, industry area, product area, technology, and you power it with information technologies, you get a doubling in the price performance that gets kicked in. And once that doubling starts, it doesn't stop. And this is very hard for us to get our heads around because you, you, have, you think it has to stop at some point, et cetera. If you can actually see the orange, orange bands, you'll see that in computation, we've gone through multiple technologies, you know, uh, vacuum tubes and transistors and now integrated circuits. You can think of each one kind of like an S-curve where it takes off, accelerates, it reaches its upper limit. Uh, and start slowing down. But if you have an information-based environment, something else always takes over the curve. And this is the secret why that curve just keeps going. And Ray has predicted the Moore's law just doesn't stop. Anytime you have this doubling pattern that starts, it just doesn't stop. And that kind of is kind of mind-blowing in itself. And this led Peter Diamandis, the, the main founder and the head of the XPRIZE Foundation, to write this book called Abundance, uh, charting out that if we can harness this acceleration and, and leverage it, we'll soon have an abundance of uh, healthcare, education, uh, clean water, energy in about a decade. And what does the world look like if, if that's the case? Uh, Peter, of course, is the head of the XPRIZE Foundation, which uh, gives large public prizes wherever there are market failures, uh, the most famous being the Ansari $10 million SpaceX prize, which led to SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, and all the nano satellite companies. Um, I joined the board of X Prize a couple of years ago with some rather interesting characters on it. Here's some of the trustees and benefactors. Um, every board meeting starts with, you know, what did Elon just do? And then we move on to the rest of the business uh, of the day. But I wanted to highlight one uh, really breakthrough thing that happened. We announced this prize about three years ago which was to create, uh, extract water out of the atmosphere. And so the challenge was, and the prize parameters, was can you create a machine that will extract clean water, water molecules out of the atmosphere, uh, 2,000 liters a day, so enough for a village or a large apartment building, using only renewable energy for less than two cents a liter, okay? So this is about uh, 25 uh, times cheaper than the current going rate for installations, et cetera, et cetera. Very uh, dramatic. Uh, and typically we design prizes to last about seven or eight years. So teams have time to uh, try multiple times, form properly, et cetera. But two and a half years in, a team pops up and says, we've done it. We tested them and it, they were right. And we now have uh, awarded this prize. And let me just repeat that. We now have a machine that can extract clean water out of the atmosphere anywhere in the world for less than two cents a liter, right? Now you think of every village in India and you've just completely changed the game or every village on a mountain in Indonesia or in Africa. And this completely changed. This is why we get so excited by uh, technology and the possible breakthroughs. Um, because if you have clean water, you take out half of the disease burden in the world. So the ripple effects get very profound indeed. The, the massive kind of uh, world breakthroughs in the world we're living in today are such that computation has infected other fields, such that we now have a dozen technologies all in that doubling pattern. And this is completely unique in human history. In the history of our world, maybe one technology was accelerating at enough or another. Never have we seen this many double all at the same time. Uh, for example, in, in neuroscience, the resolution at which we can image the brain is doubling every year. Uh, in in uh, drones are doubling every nine months in their capability. And so this is the massive opportunity because each technology is doubling, but where they intersect adds a whole other multiplier to the equation. You take cryptography, you merge it with computer science, and all of a sudden, boom, you have cryptocurrencies. And so we're seeing unbelievable breakthroughs pop out. I frame it as 20 Gutenberg moments. Um, in the 15th century, the printing press changed the world. Uh, we call that a Gutenberg moment because of the fundamental shift it instigated in society by democratizing literature. Well, solar energy changes the world completely. That water machine changes the world completely. Drones, blockchain, AI, each one. And I, I will argue that we have about 20 of those uh, CRISPR all coming along. 
And the challenge that we have uh, is that we have enormous difficulty absorbing these technologies. Uh, and I want to show you this slide for a second. This is a look at some of the broader institutions that we used to run the world. And I'll argue that every mechanism by which we run the world doesn't work for today's world, right? Uh, legal systems, healthcare systems, educational systems, uh, intellectual property fundamentally broken. And this is, uh, uh, all these institutions were actually designed for a world a few hundred years ago, uh, not for today. De definitely not for the trillion sensors and the dozens accelerating technologies that are coming down the pike. And that's the tension that you see in the world with bankers fighting Bitcoin and so on. Um, education, for example, all our education systems are designed to take a young child, train them through their early 20s to be ready for the existing job market, right? Small problem, we don't know what a job looks like in five years. Uh, we don't even know what a job looks like to, to in a year. Uh, what are we teaching them, right? Or take uh, democracy. Uh, we use, my family was very involved in the independence movement in India. And it's great that it's a democracy, but in 60 years, no infrastructure is laid down because democracies tend to devolve to high, high metabolism, short-term election cycles. Nobody's thinking about the long-term needs. Um, uh, and, and take the U.S., which, which kind of was the beginning of representative democracies. Um, they are based, they created the U.S., at a time when information was scarce. So if you were in Washington, D.C., you literally didn't know what was happening in California. The speed of a horse was as quickly as you could find out. So the Congress or the uh, Parliament or the Senate meets occasionally a few times a year to give people time to ride across the country, right? Um, well, today we have an abundance of information, gets faked, misinterpreted, misused, and every major democracy in the world is broken, right? India, of course, is a quite a mess, but India's always been a mess. Somehow it just stumbles along and, and gets there. Uh, but Brazil is broken, the UK broke three years ago, US breaking in front of our eyes, and how do you deal with that? Um, on a slightly lighter note, take the institution of marriage. Uh, we invented marriage as an institution about 9,000 years ago. Uh, and when that first surfaced as a human institution, average lifespan at the time was about 23 years old. Uh, so back then you, you got married, you had kids, and you died. Uh, uh, marriage is not designed to last 50, 60 years. Um, some of my family members in India call it state-sanctioned torture. Um, and, you know, most Indian couples should not be married, right? Or m m actually anywhere in the world. Um, it's designed for you to be there for your kids till they reach puberty, and then you should leave. And so this is the challenge now that all these institutions, and it's very hard to update an institution. And how do you organize for this accelerating change is what I've been thinking about a, a great deal. And so it led me a few years ago to write this book, Exponential Organizations, on how do you run a company or build an organization or a nonprofit that has the metabolism to deal with today's world, highly agile, flexible, adaptable, flexible, et cetera. And what we did was for about three years, 2011 to 2014, analyze the fastest growing companies in the world and teased out a set of characteristics on how they do it. So uh, the top and most important is what we call a massive transformative purpose. Google, organize the world's information. Um, uh, Uber, everybody's private driver. And it turns out every single one of these has that. And it answers the Simon Sinek question of why, uh, gives a North Star. So when you're in hyper growth, it's very easy to evaluate projects. Google is asking for the multiple projects in it if they have to decide which one organizes the world's information better. So they all have this kind of MTP or purpose-driven organization. Then on the right, what you see is five externalities that these companies use to allow them to scale very quickly. Uh, Uber doesn't hire its own staff. Uh, TED uses community and TEDx events, as we can see. Um, Google uses algorithms. Uh, Airbnb is leveraging other people's assets and bedrooms. And then digital engagement models, feedback loops, gamification give you give you the high touch with the with the user. And so those externalities companies use one or more of to keep a very rapid growth at a very low resource footprint because you can externalize a lot of the costs in this type of situation. On the left, you see a lot of internal characteristics uh, like the interfaces between Apple and its developers or Uber and its drivers, real-time dashboards. Um, well, I have a whole section in the book called Death to the Five-Year Plan because by the time you finish your five-year plan, it's out of date. 
right? Um, and we have increasing black swan events like uh, Corona. Uh, by the way, Corona has given us an amazing negative example of exponential growth. If you look at the countries that dealt with it badly, they didn't understand exponential growth very well. And they thought it was linear, 15 cases got to disappear pretty quickly. But if you're on a doubling pattern, uh, very bad. We now have, we've now seen more, spent time, more time on exponential graphs globally. All of the work the Singularity University tried to do for 12 years encapsulated in four months of this virus. Right. Unfortunately, a negative example, but the world finally, I think, collectively understands exponential growth much better. Um, back to the model, we've got dashboards, we've got the whole lean startup methodology built into the experimentation characteristic. That also is where you engender uh, taking risk. Many of our organizations are built for uh, efficiency and predictability. They're not very good at risk. And yet, in today's world, you have to be good at risk. And this was what happened at Yahoo. They got accidentally structured as a matrix organization where you have products down the verticals and all the horizontal functions like HR and IT and payroll and branding. Every time you try and do something, it takes time because you have to check off with every layer. Um, and that takes time. And the structure wants to de-risk things. And so the problem is that Yahoo is in the consumer internet where your two attributes have to be speed and, and risk. And the org structure is antithetical to the industry there. And that's the failure fundamentally. Um, anyway, so you have to be able to take risks. Then you've got autonomy, which is decentralized organization structures, very loose collaborations, and then social uh, uh, yammer, slap, chatter, et cetera. And if, if you're a startup, you should be doing all of these. Uh, if you're a big company, we found that if you fully implement four out of these 10 characteristics, uh, you get a 10x performance improvement in your organization. And so we put out this model. Uh, it's now uh, five and a half years old. Um, and I was told at the time, business book, it'll have an 18 months or, or so shelf life. Uh, uh, the damn thing has kind of taken off much more crazy than I thought. Uh, uh, in fact, it looks like sometime next year, uh, exponential organizations might crack into the top 10 best-selling business books ever list. Uh, so my, the, my publisher is very happy. Uh, my wife less so because I've been traveling like a lunatic as a result of it. But we're now finding governments using it, um, uh, uh, and we're advising heads of state as well as uh, big companies as well as startups. We think in the future people will be saying, uh, if you're not building, a, you're not building a startup, you're building an exponential organization or EXO, and if you're not, somebody else is because it turns out to be the most uh, highly resilient performance model. I'll give you a quick example. Our favorite example of Git, uh, of an EXO is GitHub, uh, the platform that many of you know that allows software developers to code. They use all 11 of these characteristics. Um, GitHub got sold to Microsoft uh, 18 months ago for $7.5 billion, okay? Uh, and this company has no assets, no workforce, no intellectual property. And I was talking to a partner, Ernst & Young, and he was like, what do you put on the balance sheet? Right? And I'm just going to repeat that. Seven and a half billion dollars, no workforce, no assets, no intellectual property really of any kind, certainly given the, the market cap. If you're not building one of those, what are you doing? And what's magical today is that you can start one of these at very low cost. Uh, and the way to go about it is pick your MTP, then find communities, uh, say it's curing cancer, then you find communities that are relevant to your world. Then you... Um, put a team together, then you find your breakthrough idea, and then you follow some of the lean startup methodologies. So you could think of the EXO model as lean plus uh, big, hairy, audacious goals plus agile all mixed together. It's kind of a maturity model, more of a tick list. And what we did was we put a label on what was already there. And so that's how we're going to, we think most organizations will be uh, operating this way. Uh, Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever, had me come and talk to them. And after reading the book, he ordered every brand in Unilever to take on an MTP. And now the five most profitable brands are the ones that have done it the most. And so we're seeing nonprofits do this. Um, a fellow called uh, Nishan Durgnarin, uh, who was the Minister of Oceans in Mauritius, told me he's applied this model to run the entire ministry uh, with community algorithms, et cetera. And so we think most organization structures over time will morph to this 
not even realizing it because this turns out to be the most hyper-efficient model. We're just starting work on the second edition of this book. The really big thing that we've been working on, though, that is relevant, especially the legacy, is this immune system problem. And we formulated a 10-week process called an EXO sprint that we piloted with uh, Procter & Gamble. And the question was, could we move leadership uh, 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 management thinking culture three years ahead in a 10-week period? And it worked. Um, um, in fact, it worked so well, I thought maybe we got lucky. So our second client was the largest insurance company in Mexico, backward, regulated, family-owned, everything. And it worked even better. And we've now done it 30 times with big companies around the world, HP, Visa, Black & Decker, and we've got cracked a model. So we've uncovered a process which we've now open sourced, by the way, where you can take any company and, and change the metabolism of it. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, Jack Welch in the year 2000 made this comment. He said that if, you're, if the metabolism of your company is slower than the outside world, you're dead. The only question is when. And so we've now found a mechanism where we can hack culture at scale and increase the metabolism in legacy companies. Because my thesis is we have to solve this immune system problem because if we don't, we can't bring in new innovation. Uh, we'll constantly leave like this and you become very French and you go, no, 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 pas possible. And we don't integrate that new technology, be it drones, be it blockchain, be it other things. Um, now we also have a nonprofit that does the same work in the public sector and we focus on that. Uh, we've created a 16 week process and worked with, say, the Supreme Court in Colombia to transform the justice system there and so on. Um, and so we have for-profit, non-profit process frameworks in a community of about 6,000 people at openexo.com, uh, which is free, where we collaborate and give tool sets for this work that we do. So solving this immune system problem is almost all of the work that I've done now. Um, and I want to give you, close with this crazy example of how dramatically you can change the world if you apply things properly. This is a company out of Miami called Wellways, and they've created that eight inch pad that you see on the right. This is to detect breast cancer. And it's a very extensive thermal mapping mechanism. So a woman would put this on left and right sides of her chest, uh, uh, wear it for about 10 minutes, take a snapshot of the barcode, and it does a very extensive temperature sensing of that part of the body. This turns out to be 80% better at detecting breast cancer than a mammogram. Uh, costs about $50, and it's FDA approved. It's FDA approved. So we can eradicate breast cancer now by just giving this out all over the world. And, and, and this is an example where we're seeing very dramatic use of information technology decentralized, it's demonetized, it's democratized, and we can completely transform the world. And we now have, because the final pieces, because all these technologies are so cheap, anybody can innovate on these technologies. And so I expect Jugard innovation to explode with all of these technologies, be it solar, water, uh, uh, healthcare, et cetera. And we're going to see the biggest explosion of innovation that we've ever seen in the world. And so that's essentially uh, what we're all about. And, and that's the model in the book that we, that we work off. So let me pause there. Uh, it's been great to be with you. Happy to go to the Q&A. Uh, go over the right back to you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Salim. So just a quick question. Uh, you know, uh, when you set up Angstro and you sold it to Google, of course, that was uh, many eons ago, given the space at which things are moving. What, yes. what, what was the problem that you were trying to solve? Uh, back then, you know, uh, we, we, there were so many news items. The problem we were trying to solve is um, uh, one of my mentors is a guy called Dan Berry. Well, if you do a search for Dan Berry, there's a million Dan Berries. There's a rugby player, there's a guitarist. And I want news about my Dan Barry. And so we created a, an AI that scanned, took your social network contacts, scanned news feeds with them, and then dissing, uh, dissing uh, I can't remember the word now, they, uh, uh, you figure out who's your Dan Barry and then create a Google News interface about people that you know. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm going to come back to this in, uh, later in the discussion. Uh, but let me, uh, you know, uh, focus on MTP, the massive transformation purpose. So there is a massive transformation purpose for an organization and there is for an individual. So how do I, as an individual, view this and what do I use as a benchmark or a metric to measure whether I am indeed doing something massive? Great question. So uh, two or three guiding questions for figuring out your MTP. A, will you wake up at 6 a.m. every morning to work on it? B, 
if somebody gave you a billion dollars, where, where, what big problem would you try and solve? And if that's it, that's interesting. And, and the third is, um, uh, if you could go after and build a company and, and solve any problem, which one would it be? Uh, and so everybody has a deep passion that they like to have solved. The founders of Waze hated traffic, right? And so they wanted to solve traffic. And the idea behind building a startup today, you know, all of our education, especially in places like India, your education and upbringing are supply side driven. Go be a doctor, go be an accountant, go be a designer, go be a software developer, and hope that the market wants what you want. What we're seeing a total shift towards is the demand side. What problem do you want to see solved? Right? As we're raising our eight-year-old, we're asking, what, what are you passionate about working on? And let that passion guide the skills he'll develop, and then that he's much more engaged. And so that's where we see a shift in both company building, but also in education in general. We'll be hiring people based on the alignment of the company MTP with the individual's MTP. So what's your eight-year-old passionate about, Salim? Uh, right now, basketball and, and soccer and Minecraft. So we'll get there. Okay, cool. So let me bring in some questions as well. Uh, and there, there are quite a few already. So uh, one of them is, and I'm just going to find the name, uh, Salim is, you know, the, the, the water project is amazing, two cents. And uh, but why is it not mass adopted? Is there a problem uh, amongst? Oh, the um, it's they they have a prototype. They now need to commercialize it, and they're putting the team together, et cetera, et cetera. This is the zero to one problem. Once you have a prototype, it takes a, a while to actually formulate the team, get the funding in place, find the right distribution mechanisms, uh, factories, et cetera. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to collaborate, and we can create something very quickly around that. Okay, so Loretta, Loretta Andrade asks, uh, business from Hyderabad, she asks, business is down, uh, things are obviously very challenging. How or what do we do to revive and restore the same? So you and, don't and restore. Me if I may add, you know, this is the problem that a lot of people who are logged in will ask one way or the other, yeah. that, you know, they're all in uh, deep shit right now. Uh, yeah. Either their companies are or their, uh, their own and startups are and so on. Yeah. So the reason I talked about some of the technologies that I mentioned and, and the acceleration that we're seeing is that we have no choice today but to transform your company or basically die. If you try and go back to the status quo, Corona is a, what we call a singularity, and it's a black hole. Everything that we knew about business before, gone. Uh, the way we old, old industries go backward 10 years and modern industries, digital industries go forward 10 years. So we move very quickly to new subscription models, new forms of business models in healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a huge mistake to go back to where we, we were. In fact, what we're working on now, uh, we've convened a global event called Exo World because uh, this global super tanker has been ground to a halt and left to itself, our leaders will take it back to where we were, which is terrible for climate change income inequality, extractionary capitalism, et cetera. Let's grab the wheel while it's stopped and wrench it and turn it in a better direction. So the way to think about this if you're a business is to uh, come up with your MTP and go build a business in the way that you wanted to rather than the fact that your family inherited this or you've always been doing that. Go find your passion and go build on that passion. Uh, the status quo is not coming back. The U.S. is showing us that we can't really contain it. Some countries will be better at containing than others, but we're in for a two to three year lockdown until we have mass testing or mass vaccination possible. And so um, uh, given the resistance of vaccination, lots of people won't, will refuse to get vaccinated. And now we have a really big problem uh, around the world. So basically, until we have mass testing on a regular basis, we're in it for the long haul. This will totally change economic structures globally. So the question on machines that make water came from Pranav Agarwal in uh, Mumbai. But uh, Salim, are any of your companies or uh, companies that you're advising working on either a vaccine or a cure for COVID-19? Uh, there's a bunch of people in our field. Uh, Daniel Kraft, uh, Raymond McCauley, some of the faculty at Singularity University are all advising companies. Uh, vaccine, you know, uh, vaccines can take decades to yeah. create. So to say one is available in a few months is a sheer lie. We don't know how the virus might mutate etc. It may be a year or two before we have a vaccine. But the good news is Raymond McCauley calls this the first battle in the last war, sorry, the, la the first battle in the war against disease. 
uh, and he thinks we're in for a period of time where we have enough breakthroughs that we essentially eradicate disease going forward. So very optimistic uh, on that side. You know, we have two possibilities for the world today. We have either a Star Trek future or a Mad Max future. And we kind of have to pick which one we're going down. Our political leaders are pushing us down a Mad Max path right now, be it uh, um, uh, the Israeli West Bank in that stupidity or Brazil or, or the US. We have to find a way how to tilt that future. And it really comes down to entrepreneurs and business owners to do that work. So you've talked about abundance and uh, I, I, somewhere else you've talked about energy abundance. So now abundance is in contrast to something which is scarcity. Yes. And uh, tell us about that. Well, think about the idea that almost every business in the world for 5,000 years is based on scarcity, right? If, in fact, in most cases today, if you don't have scarcity, you don't have a business. And so this is an enormous shift. Uh, we're, for the first time of the last decade, we're seeing business models around abundance. And maybe one way to frame exponential organizations is that they're business models around abundance. Uh, Uber is tapping into an abundance of cars lying around. Airbnb is tapping into an abundance of extra bedroom. But as we get to water abundance, energy abundance, et cetera, we've, the big um, uh, business model shift that we've seen, the best example is the music industry, which used to sell scarcity, the physical record or CD or DVD, et cetera. Then we got to, we digitize music, right? So there's the information about Napster broke that model. Um, and all the major music studios that were selling scarcity pretty much disappeared. And now you have two platforms, iTunes and Spotify, selling abundance on a subscription model. So this is the thing. The scarcity people disappear. We move to abundance, and you have typically a subscription business model and unlimited consumption. We expect that same transition to happen in transportation, healthcare, energy, education, et cetera. And, and when you say energy, is it because you see cost of solar uh, power oh, yeah. operations? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the price of oil is, is a highly tightly won market. The last oil price crash was because of a 2% oversupply in the market. Solar energy is doubling every 22 months and has been for 40 years. At this pace, we'll be able to deliver all of our energy needs with solar in 10 years. We're only five doublings away. So that is completely transforms the, the world. I mean, the Middle East basically collapses. Uh, the U.S. has to find other reasons to go to war. Um, I can make that joke as a Canadian. Um, Canada, 40% of exports are oil. So the foundation of the Canadian economy is done in 10 years. And so this is the, an incredible stress factor when you, at the commercial level, but unbelievable opportunity for solar microgrids. Uh, note the poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world. Right? So we're going to get this energy abundance pretty quickly. Chile in South America is already generating so much solar, they're giving it to their neighbors for free. It's actually happening right now. So this is going to happen. It's just a question of how quickly. The base load ideally should be taken over by small form nuclear, uh, but that's kind of a bad word right now. For political reasons and other reasons. Okay, yeah. Uh, Shneel Malik asks, uh, do you see, how do you see clean tech, green tech technologies disrupting the current supply chain, especially when it comes to social change as an inherent property of tackling climate change? So um, uh, the green tech and clean tech stuff, clean energy is not enough to solve climate change. If we stop all fossil fuel emissions today, it's still too late. Uh, we have to figure out how to uh, decarbonize the atmosphere and extract carbon at scale. And we have the biggest X prize ever. The biggest prize ever offered is a $100 million prize to figure that out. So there is an area to go after. Um, I, I actually moved to Florida and lived in Miami for the last few years uh, because according to our numbers, in about 20 years, Miami is gone. So better, better enjoy it while it's there. But cities like Mumbai, uh, Shanghai are in deep threat because of climate change. Um, uh, so this is an enormous challenge. So, but the business opportunities coming from that are unbelievable because we can not have to bother with the centralized grid so security becomes easier. Um, the big challenge that we proposed at XPRIZE recently was off-grid storage at 50 times cheaper than today. And so anybody can solve that will basically create the generation side with solar and storage side. And then um, if you can basically handle, that'll handle most uh, situations in the world and we'll essentially rid ourselves of centralized fossil fuel grids. Yeah, and, and you're saying that fossil fuel uh, uh, operating cost is more than the capex yeah. of uh, this is a great. This is a really important point. Just to give you an example of how dramatically this is changing. Three years ago, 
we hit an incredibly important inflection point where it became cheaper to create a new solar facility than a fossil fuel facility to generate power. And that was a massive inflection point. And pretty much all power generation for the last three years has been solar, except for the legacy ones that are in track. Uh, last year, a year ago, we had a second, even more important uh, inflection point. It is now cheaper to build a solar facility than it is to continue running the fossil fuel facility, right? So the, the capex and opex of solar are now cheaper than just the opex of a facility. So now basically we'll see the shutdown for economic reasons. It doesn't matter what policy you want. But you now shut down all fossil fuel uh, uh, things over time. You, you know what Corona has given us? It's given us the first win against climate change. It's the first time ever we've actually gone, wow, we can actually do this. We have a clean air for the first time in 100, 200 years. And so uh, as people see that, they're going to be loath to going back to the way we were, hopefully. Right, and, and uh, you know, I mean, just yesterday, uh, we've seen the uh, launch of a new solar array uh, for uh, in India, inauguration, perhaps the only manufacturing uh, production establishment that's been launched uh, at a time like this, uh, uh, you know, which is the solar. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, let, let, you know, uh, a lot of questions on uh, healthcare. And, uh, you know, I think the questions, if I were to, uh, you know, uh, synthesize them is really, what can be, I mean, one is what are the changes that you see uh, you see, and more importantly, what is the technology that you can bring to bear to solve some of the fundamental technology, I mean, the, some of the fundamental healthcare challenges, and of which COVID is one part? Yeah, well, there's, an, uh, there's a huge array of information technologies now being applied to healthcare. You know, uh, we've been driving healthcare on four basic metrics for hundreds of years, uh, temperature, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, maybe glucose levels, pretty much that's it. But now I can gauge the, with all the wearables and the analytical capabilities, I have like wellways which can detect uh, breast cancer easily. Uh, we can I can correlate the growth rate of my toenails to the metabolism of my of my kidney. In about a year, we'll have a sensor that says, "Listen, don't drink that chai right now. I'm still metabolizing the donut you just ate. <laughs> so give me ten minutes, and then you, you know we'll we'll be able to kind of analyze and diagnose and do predictive." Uh, modeling on healthcare. But there are two things that I think are very profound. One is CRISPR, uh, the, uh, the, the ability to now edit our own genome. And think of the human body as 10 trillion cells, each governed by your genome. And we can now edit the genome as easily as you can edit software. Okay, So the human being is basically now a software engineering problem. Uh, so just, just sit with that for a bit. That has profound implications. We essentially will be programming ourselves. And all of the, this is why I'm so optimistic about India, all of the IT skills and the uh, raw ingenuity and the Jugar innovation and the uh, madness of the people, right, will basically allow us to uh, take advantage of these technologies like a few other places and match things together in ways that we never expected and come up with some really profound things in the future. So um, CRISPR is one of them. There's another one called Focused Ultrasound, which allows you to, to do uh, almost surgery inside your body with high, high frequency sound um, and burns off uh, tumors and other things like that. That plus the diagnostics completely changed the game. We expect that we'll eradicate cancer in the next five to seven years, uh, mostly through early detection. Um, but then Alzheimer's, we now kind of get a glimpse of how to deal with uh, Alzheimer's. So little by little, we're getting uh, better. The question is, what do we do when we break through the escape velocity barrier in aging and we're living a long time, right? It was one thing to have a marriage when you're, the marriage is supposed to last 50, 60 years. What happens when marriage is supposed to last 100 years? What are you supposed to do then? So this is going to cause some interesting discussions. Right, and you also, in a way, answered the questions that were about, you know, what do what is the Indian, uh, how do we uh, better use uh, or extract value from the Indian IT ecosystem and what we've built in the past? Maybe if you want to expand on that further. Yeah, I think there's two or three things. One is shift off the IT support to actually innovating in technology and information technologies. The, the raw skills are completely there. That's number one. Number two, uh, have to solve corruption and governance because democracy is too slow to decide how to do things. And that's a huge issue around that. The third really is um, when I look at India and I look at it having, I've now lived a quarter of my life in India, Canada, Europe, and the US. So I have a pretty balanced view as to what's 
or equally confused view as to how to operate. Uh, the big challenge in India is that we're very, very good on the spiritual side, incredibly good on the tactical side, very, very bad in the emotional side. We are not good at dealing with emotions that get repressed. Every Indian family crams down on any emotional expression of any kind, um, uh, unless you're in a very artist friendly, etc. cetera. And we, we put everything on the spirituality side. Uh, and therefore, there's a lot of crud that has to be cleansed out of, of the Indian psyche in terms of emotional expression. Uh, the whole country doing ayahuasca would probably solve it, but that would be a logistical challenge. Um, but then you then you set up, because the, the magic, I think, uh, is that people deeply understand or integrated with the spiritual self. And I, I think in the end, that will be India's biggest strength. It's already been India's biggest gift to the world. I think it becomes its biggest strength if in real time and space we can navigate the logistics of it. Okay, uh, question from Jalat Sharma. He's, uh, so he flips your uh, point. He says, uh, building on your point on the oil and gas industry, is it time for the industry uh, to still find ways or can it still find ways to revamp itself? Uh, maybe not through fuels, but some other derivatives. And in a way, the larger question being that uh, anyone who is exponential out uh, or looking like they're going to get exponential out, what do they do? Yeah, good question. So the way to do, if you're being exponential out, is to basically leapfrog. Um, um, I'll give you an example. So if you have an existing organization or industry or company, um, what you do is you go find a, an adjacency that's radically, typically with a different model, where you can apply your capabilities very well. So if you're in oil and gas and you have deep expertise in some of that, let's use manufacturing. Let's say you say you're a car maker, okay? Um, now, you're in big trouble right now uh, because if you use a car, it sits empty 96% of the time and it's highly inefficient and model, new models are popping up. Well, you have unbelievable capability for manufacturing, mass production, etc. Move to drones, move to other things that need to be built and translate your, your capability very quickly. And the way you do this is you leave the existing model. Do not do disruptive innovation in the mothership because the immune system will hate you and you'll end up in a political fight. You also don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What you do is you set up edge innovation at the edge of the organization, small EXOs going to adjacent spaces in a portfolio approach. Uh, Nestle for years tried to run Nespresso as a line of business, failed, failed, failed. Finally, they put it as a separate line of business. Boom, it's a $6 billion business, right? So you take your disruptive and the crazy people in your organization, put them at the edge, let them build EXOs into adjacent spaces, and then let that become a new gravity center. Because the next level is if one of those is successful, the natural instinct will be to bring it back in to manage it properly, and it always fails. Always fails. Just let it go, spin it off, and that's the next level. And so then you end up with a kind of an ongoing a flow model like that, and that's how we see companies operating. The master of this is Apple. Think of the way Apple works. They'll form a small team that's very disruptive. They'll take that team to the edge of the organization. They'll keep them totally stealth and secret, and they will say to them, go disrupt another industry, right? Nobody does this. Nobody's even noticed that this is what Apple does. So they have a portfolio of teams looking at different industries. When something is ready for a disruption, they go into it with a new product and fold it into the iTunes platform. And so in the future, we see platform business models and ecosystem business models. The idea of the large operating company is pretty much dead um, because the, all the mechanisms that made it useful to have a big operating company in the 20th century, none of that applies in the 21st century. So here's an education question. And uh, he asks, uh, how is the, Amish Mehra asks, how is the education sector set to revolutionize? And uh, is it uh, going to be online, pen or paper? Well, it's, it's, it desperately needs to be uh, um, re-engineered from the ground up. We do education in a push model. You get a bunch of kids in a classroom and you're trying to cram algebra into them, right? Mostly they're thinking about lunch. And the teaching is mass production teaching. It's not geared to the individual learning style uh, or the habits of the person, etc. We have profoundly better understanding of neural retention, pedagogical techniques, etc. And you can't apply it in the legacy environment because the teachers will fight you, the regulators will fight you, the textbook manufacturers will fight you, etc. Uh, let me give you a dramatic example. If you're doing a master's degree in any of the topics that we I covered earlier, AI, robotics, um, biotech, etc., literally today, by the time you finish your master's degree, you're out of date because the pace of change in the field is moving faster than our ability to teach it. 
So that's a structural issue. So what we need in education is a complete shift from education systems to learning systems. Gone are the days when you say, I'm gonna learn and become, become a valuable tradesman of some kind through my early 20s, apply that for 50 years and then retire. That's gone. What education now becomes is an ongoing partnership where you pick a problem that you wanna solve and then find and get the education to where you wanna go. Uh, think of the most valuable employees and colleagues that you have in your company or in your ecosystem. They're the ones that learn the fastest, right? And the, if you bring it to the institution, the successful companies are the ones that learn the best. And the learning organization is where we get through in the future. Uh, okay. Sunil Malhotra, who's one of our colleagues in Delhi, has written a great uh, piece on this uh, about how we move forward rather than backward on Medium over the last couple of days. Um, we the, the, the challenge is to solve that institutional legacy educational problem because, as I mentioned, academia is the worst immune system ever. I'll give a quick little story. I gave a talk to, two years ago to 700 deans of business schools. Um, uh, you know, who knew, but there's a conference where they all get together. And the organizer at the beginning is excited to say, hey, Salim's here to talk about us, sees complete blank looks in the audience, says, how many of you have read EXO? And it was two out of 700 that even, even heard about it, right? Every MBA school today teaches you how to build a 20th century organization. There's not a single one that can teach you how to build Uber. And that's even worse for some of the older uh, professions, accounting, et cetera. So we're in a point where education, uh, the way we did it for the last few hundred years, is completely irrelevant for what's coming in the future. Salim, how do you tell that's an Indian parent? How do you tell an Indian parent? How would you have told your parents uh, uh, 40 years ago uh, or yeah. whatever uh, that, you know, I want to chase a problem and uh, don't push yeah. me into engineering? No, no, not medicine. easy. <laughs> the, the work of the Indian youth is to basically tell their parents, thank you very much. You know, think about this. If you went back a thousand years ago, one generation led exactly the same lives as the next generation, as the next generation, as the next generation. Life didn't change. So you could pass wisdom down, and then we encode that in religious structures, social practices, social behaviors, the caste system, whatever, to keep conformity, because you can really manage a civilization well in that model. Think about how different our lives are from our parents, right? Fundamentally different. Our kids' lives are even more different. Uh, and I can give you a crazy little glimpse anecdote on that. But the, the, what our parents had to teach us doesn't apply to us and doesn't apply to our kids. So education, the way in which we were taught, doesn't apply. In the way we, so the work that the Indian youth has to do is to very politely say to the elder generation, thank you, you know, very nice, but the world is different. We need to do things in a different way. And the way the best analogy for this comes from Lawrence Bloom. Everything that we've done over the last few years, a few decades, has been like the booster rocket that got humanity out of poverty, out of um, we're now mass connected, et cetera, and it lifted us out of that gravity well. When you get to a certain point, capitalism, fossil fuels, all of those structures, now we need to jettison those old structures and a much lighter craft takes you into space. And we're at that inflection point where we have to very care, very quickly cut the old, otherwise it'll pull you back in the, into the gravity well and let this thing go and do it in a very different way. Now, if you've spent 20 years in the oil and gas industry or in a legacy industry, you cannot, you cannot see that future in a clean way. You have to totally go to the next generation and let them do it. Okay, so uh, let me bring you back to health uh, and yes. medicine. Gretchen De Silva, I hope I, I pronounced that right, asks, so Dear Salim, how can India reach medical facilities to the poorest of the poor in the country with your model or what I mean, uh, what I think yeah. he or she means is your thinking? Yeah, so think about that breast cancer idea. Today we treat breast cancer by a mammogram, which is hugely expensive, only available in big cities, uh, et cetera. And now we can basically take that pad. In India, I would get the big companies in the world, the, the industrialists, and say, you sponsor this for every woman in the country and just give it out and we'll eradicate breast cancer. Now, it's not a big problem in India compared to some other countries because of the way the genetics work, but it's still there enough. Um, now, uh, if you think about that idea, all of the diagnostic tests and so on become incredibly cheaper, simpler as time goes by, and that $10 million machine becomes a $10 mapping device that can be easily distributed. And India's genius at mass distribution, right? <laughs> this is the, the core capability of the country and the population. Uh, I'll give you an example that will give you a correlate to this. 
there was a fishing village in Vietnam where once a month a big ship would come with diesel fuel to power their fishing boats and fill up the fuel depot. And at some point the ship stopped coming, didn't make economic sense, and these poor fishermen have no fuel for their fishing boats. And they're completely stuck. And what do they do? So one of them looks up on the internet, sees solar panel, uh, orders it, looks up the instructions on how to wire it to the propeller. Uh, essentially, they invented a solar-powered boat. So they put the solar panel on the canopy, and they have a little putt-putt solar-powered boat because a fishing boat doesn't need to go that fast. Um, and they've invented a solar-powered boat. So here you have disruptive innovation using cutting-edge technologies happening at the edge of civilization, right? You let the Indian mentality loose on blockchain CRISPR drones, and, and Lord help us. Um, and so we're going to see an explosion of innovation come out. We just have to get out of the mindset of the way we did things before. And this is maybe the hardest work to do, is how do you break through legacy mindsets, both at an individual, cultural, religious level, but also at the, at the company level, and even harder at the government institutional level. Um, I, I, on government and institutions, I'm going to ask you a question, but let me take a few more. Uh, Vatsal Gaur asks, how close are we to the world where AI will run businesses and governance with humans raising their consciousness and adopting more creative pursuits and jobs? Wait a minute, not fair. There's about six questions baked in there. Uh, um, we're, we're kind of mostly there. Frankly, human beings should not be making decisions in, in that way. Uh, we are terrible. Our, our biases uh, skew us enough or corruption gets in the mix. The phrase I'm, I'm in, uh, kind of getting used to more and more and enjoying a lot is, uh, comes, is, is technological socialism, okay? So socialism fails because governments allocating resources is too inefficient and it's ripe for corruption, okay? But if an AI, an algorithm, can decide which driver should pick up which passenger in Uber, uh, Uber is basically a socialist app, right? Um, and it's sharing assets amongst a large number of, um, number of people. That's socialism or uh, asset sharing at the broadest level. When an algorithm decides it, it's much, much more efficient, and we can actually scale that. So I'm expecting that uh, we kind of start adopting this idea of social techno uh, uh, technological socialism more and more, where we start uh, allocating resources via AIs, government decisions. All our private media decisions are now made by AI. YouTube algorithms, Facebook algorithms, Twitter algorithms. Uber is an algorithm, basically, at its heart. When we start applying that at government level, we'll be able to allocate resources much more effectively. And the holy grail is AI layered on top of a blockchain-type structure to give it the resilience, etc. Think about almost every government function in the world is stamping, yes, you have the right age, yes, you have the building permit, etc. You apply blockchain, you don't need any of that. 90% of government functionality gets eradicated. And what, as we apply these technologies, um, now it gives us freedom to be spiritually expressed, express humor, passion, creativity, uh, get into the arts, etc., etc. Um, we've seen in history, when a society meets abundance, uh, you typically get four things. Um, uh, food, art, music, and sex, uh, not in that order. Uh, and so uh, uh, we saw this in India when the Mughals took over, there was an explosion of art and creativity, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll see the same thing as we get abundance of healthcare, education, clean water, food. We'll start, and we're spending more and more time on the, on the uh, spiritual pursuits and on the self-actualization. We move up Maslow's hierarchy very, very quickly. You know, we, we, I'm a deep believer in something Ray Kurzweil said, which was, he said, technology is a major driver in, in, of humanity. It might actually be the only major driver of progress. Um, and if that's the case, and now we have a dozen technologies accelerating, there's incredible optimism for what happens with the future of healthcare or education or uh, uh, supply chain and so on. Right. Um, so that's definitely a new way to look at things. Uh, I wouldn't have thought of applying the socialism uh, imprint onto Uber or uh, anything that's AI-driven. Sachdev Ramakrishna asks, uh, there are a lot of bright minds solving intractable, uh, intractable problems in our social sector, but somehow fixing these issues still seems out of our grasp and seems to take forever. How can we accelerate both the collective desire and the ability to solve for? Yeah, you need two things. You need first the mindset difference and the technologies, right? So the technologies are, are now there and the mindset we kind of have as long as, and at the worst you have generational change. The big challenge now is to get the legacy out of the way. 
and get the immune system and, 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 and solve that problem. I'll give you a small example. I was uh, talking to the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka last year uh, in Colombo, and they were, they were just starting a half, uh, $500 billion project to upgrade the port. They need more containers, the city's grown. Uh, so they borrowed Chinese money, now they're hugely in debt as a country, and, and it's a mess. And you get all the chaos around rebuilding of the port. I was said to him, wait, wait, hold, let me run two. So I ran on the back of an envelope, uh, some calculations. A drone today can carry a thousand kilos. It's doubling in its price performance every nine months. An average container is 20,000 kilos, okay? So in three doublings, a drone will go from 1,000 to 2,000 to 4,000 to 8,000 kilos, okay? And if a drone carries 20,000, then four drones picking up the corner of each of a container basically can lift it off a ship and put it on a train or a truck uh, and you don't need a port, okay? So if you wait, and by the way, upgrading the port will take about six or seven years, whereas waiting three doublings for the drones is 27 months. So if you just wait for the exponential technology to catch up, you don't need infrastructure in the same way, right? So this is the mindset shift, like the healthcare idea, that completely breaks through the old clear. You have to be open to that. Now the challenge is go to the mayor, the port officials, all the people and say, this is the better way to do things. And you'll get that immune system response. And we've been working on tool sets to do that. As I said, we've now open sourced those. Anybody can take their company and run them through a 10 week process or in the public sector, it takes 16 weeks. <clears throat> Miami was about to spend $2 billion on light rail. And I was able to say to the city council, this is 18th century technology. You know, why would you spend $2 billion on that? Uh, six, and they we ran our process, they completely uh, got rid of that. And now what they're doing is they're testing uh, electric sc uh, scooters on Miami Beach, they're testing electric bikes in Doral, they're testing ride sharing in the core downtown corridor. And as they see something working, they're merging into the mainstream. So we've transformed them in 16 weeks from old style top down RFI, RFP, uh, uh, linear type of approach to this multiple experiments at very low cost and then merge it when you see have an evidentiary basis okay. for the future. So that's what we're able to achieve. Now we need to scale that. What I want to do now is in every major city in the world, convene a group of about a thousand what I call super citizens, a combination of the TEDx, Singularity, EXO, Davos Young Global Leader, and create a, like a Peace Corps, a citizen's army that votes up and down what problems they want to see solved. And then we show up and give the tools to support that. And we're doing that in our in our new venture called Exo World. Salim, we're almost out of time. So let me throw a quick last question to you. Who's the one uh, entrepreneur that you've been most impressed by and uh, in thought, uh, execution, and sure, let's say... Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, we really have to be on Musk. Uh, um, he's the Steve Jobs. You should. Hundred eighty million, eighty million into ten, seventy into another, ten into another. His wife asked him the following week, um, "We have to pay the rent." And he had forgotten to leave money aside to pay the rent. Okay, so so a divorce followed very quickly afterwards. I'll give you a quick example of this. One of the things he's working on is the Hyperloop, where he wants to go from LA to San Francisco, five hour trip in 20 minutes. I have a degree in theoretical physics. If you accelerate a human being from zero to 4,000 miles an hour and decelerate them back to zero in 20 minutes, you're, you're probably going to kill them. And his response was, yeah, it's an issue. Okay? It's an issue. So for me, it's an intractable problem. And I would have said, whoa, 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 we, we, need, we can't do that. And he's like, yeah, we have to overcome that issue. And when you look at it from that, that mindset, do anything. So if I could give you one thought, we have the technologies today that anything is possible, right? 18-year-old uh, Vitalik Buterin decides to ignore his professors and creates Ethereum, right, at age of 18. Age is not a barrier. Technology is not a barrier. Cost is not a barrier. Now it's just mindset. How crazy do you dare to be? And because as we know from history, the crazy people are the ones that change the world. Well, uh, Salim, uh, uh, Banderboy and uh, Mumbai Kar, once upon a time, thank you very much for uh, being with us and uh, sharing your thoughts and hope to uh, see you in these parts at some yes. time. 
Uh, Can I give a short plug? Event. Yes, please do. And, uh, go to exoworld.live on Tuesday. We're doing a one-day online event uh, for small businesses around the world uh, with Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever and the head of the International Chamber of Commerce. And it's a day-long event on how do you survive 2020 if you're a small business. Right. And uh, that's one for note to end on. So I do uh, invite all of you. Uh, I'm sure you're, you want to get more of uh, Salim and you should uh, at this conference. So do join us. Thank you very much once again for dropping by this evening. The, there is a backstage. Uh, some of you have got invitations for that. So for those of you who have, uh, I'll, we'll see you there. And for the rest, uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Govind. Thank you, Salim. It was amazing.